Excellent. Okay. Well, I guess I will get started then. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to give this presentation. And um, I'm, my name is Quentin Ferrix, as mentioned. Um, I'm the director of technology at Qualia Research Institute, uh, we're a research uh, nonprofit based in San Francisco. And I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to, to who we are here in the first couple slides, just as a as context. Um, and so, uh, so Qualia Research Institute is we're we're working on building a new science of consciousness in order to study the properties of consciousness qualia in a consistent, meaningful, and rigorous way. Um, and one of the core organizing principles that we, we believe in at QRI is that better philosophy of mind will in turn lead to better neuroscience, which will also in turn lead to the design of better technologies for treating um, mental illness and promoting mental well-being. And the presentation today, I'm going to be focusing on kind of that second piece. Uh, how do we build better models for neuroscience, which can be helpful in the design of, of technology? Um, but kind of our bottom line at QRI is, is in treating mental illness and, uh, and promoting yes, mental well-being. Um, and just a little overview of the team, uh, many of whom I think will be in this, in this presentation today. Um, uh, we have two co-directors of research, uh, Andres Gomez Emelson and uh, Mike, Michael Edward Johnson. Our, our uh, executive director is Andrew Zuckerman. Uh, there's me, I'm the director of technology and a little bit about my um, uh, interest and background is I, I studied computer science and philosophy neuroscience psychology at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. I'm very interested in the connections between computational theory and, uh, and neuroscience. Uh, and so of course, Dr. Kristen's work has been extremely interesting and, and um, uh, a touch point for a lot of my um, interests. And then Kenzi Dian, our director of operations and uh, Sean McGowan, our research coordinator. Um, and sorry, just, just to be sure, my, my screen is still frozen, so I just wanna make sure that everybody is still <laughs> hearing me. It's showing, don't worry. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> we'll let you know um, if it disappears. Awesome, thanks. Um, and I also put the slide in here just to say that um, a lot of the core ideas that I'll be talking about in this presentation were originally developed by uh, Mike Johnson, our, our co-founder and co-director of research. And many ideas throughout the presentation come from various team members. And so I wanted to just say that at the outset, um, just so it's not you know, the, the appearance of me just presenting my own um, ideas. A lot of these models came from um, this other like, people. Um, okay. And then some context for the, the frameworks that we're going to be talking about here a little bit. Um, uh, neural annealing is a, a synthesis, an extension of some principles of self-organization that um, have been recently applied to theoretical neuroscience. Um, so first there's, of course, the, uh, the free energy principle, which is bedrock of understanding computational uh, self-organization in the brain around the minimization of surprise. And I'm sure everyone in this group is, of course, very familiar with, with the free energy principle. Um, and then the idea, um, so there's computational self-organization and then energetic self-organization uh, and the entropic brain hypothesis from uh, Dr. Robin Carr Harris, who's a, actually an advisor to, to QRI, um, uh, is another key component. A and then physical self-organization. And we're going to talk about that in connection um, with connectome resonances uh, and specifically connectome specific harmonic waves, which is, was developed by uh, Selen Atasoy at University of Oxford. Um, and so these sort of three pillars are going to build the, the, the uh, foundation for this idea of neural annealing. Um, this mechanism was first introduced uh, in, in the context of meditation in 2018 by uh, Mike Johnson. Uh, and this is specifically in terms of jhana meditation, which is a, a set of eight progressively more deep and refined uh, states of consciousness that are quite important in certain Theravadan Buddhist traditions. And then the, the first two bullet points of computational self-organization and energetic self-organization were synthesized in this amazing uh, piece called Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics in 2019. Um, and there's just a lot of deep um, connections between the ideas of neuroscience and meditation and this Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics model. And so after that paper came out in 2019, uh, uh, there's another piece on the connection between psychedelics, meditation, and music, and how those all might correspond to this, this core mechanism of, of, uh, of neural annealing. Um, and so that's sort of the context that I wanted to set, and I'll go into each of these in more detail, um, but just sort of as a roadmap of, of the, the content here. Um, 
So I <laughs> wouldn't want to spend too much time explaining <laughs> the free energy principle, but just to have a single slide on it um, and, and zero in on it as a, as a concept of, of how the brain seeks, uh, well, I guess I would say equilibria, but really non-equilibrium steady states uh, around the minimization of, of free energy, of course. Um, and the account of the brain as a Markov blanket minimizing the difference between uh, a, a generative model and sense perception. Um, and then the entropic brain hypothesis, and this is a, this image here is a, a picture of your brain on, on psilocybin, um, which was part of the, the uh, context for which this idea was introduced. And this idea has to do with um, understanding variational free energy and uncertainty in terms of, of um, entropy, which is actually a dimensionless uh, unit, but it's within certain bounds, it, it, it correlates with uncertainty, and within certain bounds of its entropy, it's appropriate to understand uh, the subjective character of states as, as, um, as being defined in some sense by, by this entropy uh, quality. And in the model of the free energy principle, the top-down priors, as opposed to sort of the, the bottom-up um, sense data can function as sort of energy sinks uh, where energy can be sort of soaked up by, by, by the brain. Um, and one of the principal actions of psychedelics is introduced in this, uh, this paper, the relaxed beliefs under psychedelics, is that the, the buildup of energy uh, that results from primarily excitatory uh, currents in the pyramidal neurons, and I'll, I'll explain that a little more in a second, results in this entropic disintegration, pushing the energy into a new sort of state of stable attractors that, that disrupt the, the existing attractors in, in the brain. Um, sorry. Uh, so yes, so, so this is the rebus in the anarchic brain model, which synthesizes the free energy principle and EBH. So there is energy that builds up, builds up in the brain due to neural excitation, and primarily the activity of most psychedelics is at the 5-HT2A receptor. And so as introduced in the paper, the increased activity at 5-HT2AR specifically uh, leads to excitatory postsynaptic currents, and that actually leads to a dissociation between the, the cortical pyramidal neurons and local field potentials. And what's really interesting is this also causes a, a decrease in the in activity in the alpha frequency band, and it's hypothesized, and, and there's many uh, references to, to indicate the fact that this that the, the alpha band perhaps is a mechanism that carries this, these top-down priors that, that, are, that exist in the brain. And so this disruption of the alpha frequency band is perhaps an, a, an appropriate mechanism for understanding uh, how, how these, the precision weighting of these priors changes as a result of the activity of psychedelics. And so <laughs> there's, I guess, a lot of words in this slide, but um, that buildup of energy causes crosses a, a threshold for metastability and the brain enters this high energy state. And that allows the brain to then self-organize into a, a new equilibrium uh, that either refines or builds new, new, mod, new predictive models. And then the brain will cool, so it sort of will settle into new states, uh, new, new attractor basins. Um, and we can sort of say that emotional processing can be thought of as this process of entropic dis disintegration and then sort of some kind of search mechanism, and then this annealing or cooling uh, process. And to, to explain what, uh, what annealing actually is, there's a metaphor that comes from, from metallurgy, which I think is actually very interesting and applicable, where in order to increase the ductility of a metal, and that has to do with its, its strength and flexibility, there's properties that are uh, desirable in, in certain metals. If there's sort of cold work imperfections in the metal already. Something that you can do is you can heat up the, the metal past its, its uh, recrystallization temperature, and then you allow the metal in a similar way to self-organize, and then it recrystallizes in a more ductile, strong um, configuration. And there's also this, this idea has been uh, posited in, in machine learning as well, um, the idea of simulated annealing, which is a, is a global optimization algorithm that that uh, takes a, it has a, a, a similar mechanism of action. I think it's it's interesting to think about this in the context of of the brain because when you compare 
simulated annealing to other um, to other potential implementations of of mechanisms for updating the weights and biases in in a in an artificial neural network, it actually kind of makes sense for uh, for, for the brain because the simulated annealing algorithm is is better at finding in a certain set amount of time a an approximate global optimum as a Opposed to a, a, a very precise local optimum, and so that's actually perhaps more closer to what to what the brain is doing at a system level than say what artificial uh, neural networks are doing in terms of clear clear optimization of a particular objective function in a sort of a lo local sense. Um, and I think the the example that I've shown here is the the, the GIF here in the, in the bottom right hand corner is uh, the traveling salesperson problem. Uh, which is a what's called an MP hard problem, meaning that there's there are not very good polynomial time solutions for for this optimization problem. But it turns out that simulated annealing is a good is a good method for finding approximate global solutions to to the traveling salesperson problem. And so I just include that as a as an example of how this mechanism works. And this concept is also um, referenced in um, in the Rudis paper as well. Uh, Okay, and then the um, the physical uh, self-organization principle that I'll be talking about is connectome specific harmonic waves. And I wish I, I think it might be a little tricky for me to actually show the, the video that I was going to show here, but the connectomes, connectome harmonics are a, a, a neurological reference to this, this process of, of um, organization around certain patterns that we see actually for uh, sound. And one of the, the canonical examples here is something called Cladney plates. And so these plates where uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plate that you induce a, a frequency, induce a, a sound wave of a certain frequency, and there will be characteristic, and you pour sand on top of the Cladney plate, and there will be sort of characteristic patterns that start to emerge. And so if you can see my cursor here, there's, uh, there's a, um, you know, each, each of these patterns is seen at a certain characteristic frequency and and so we can apply this the the equations for, for wave propagation that we find from these standing waves in, in sound to activation inhibition patterns within the brain and this is actually very interesting because it shows you sort of the core resonances that exist in the brain at, at different fundamental frequencies and it's a very interesting dimensionality reduction technique for looking at brain activity uh, in terms of being a a finite set of of these connectome wide resonances and i'll explain a little bit more about how exactly these resonances are generated essentially that's the idea that we're able to look at the entire brain and its resonances over time and it's a good way of understanding these these core these core resonances so the way that this is actually done is there's imaging with magnetic resonance imaging and diffusion tensor imaging and we generate uh, cortical surfaces, and then also a, a tractography of the white matter, internal white matter tracts of the brain. And those are combined to, to generate a connectivity matrix of the connectome, the graph of caution. And then we take the, the eigenmodes of that, of that matrix, and those give us the, the connectome harmonics. And, and here, I think they, yeah, the first 1,000 harmonics, and you can see the patterns of activation inhibition here are quite similar to, or well, at least analogous to these patterns that we see in the first image. Um, and so we can then take uh, fMRI volumes and, oh, I think I might be missing a slide there. Oh, I was just in a different order. So I guess I'll go forward and then back. So we can take fMRI volumes and we can consider them as a decomposition or, or a weighted sum of those first 1,000 connectome harmonic resonances, we can see how superposition of those resonances creates the activity that we're seeing at a given time point. And this is a really powerful technique because it does something that's similar to you know, what we see in, um, in something like the Fourier transform, where you go from having a, a time domain representation of, of neural activity from fMRI to a frequency space representation. And that allows you to do a lot of interesting things with with uh, th that resulting uh, frequency space representation. 
I think this slide says something fairly similar, but just shows that there's uh, the, there are the, the, the power you can define the energy and power spectra that are represented for each one of the each one of the harmonics. And so here you can see there's uh, essentially more energy contained within the low frequency harmonics and the upper frequency harmonics, especially towards towards uh, the 100th harmonic. And that's very common. But this is something that we can use as a fingerprinting mechanism, such that you can look at a state it be that a, a resting state or a state that's characterized by some, some psychedelic. And you can look at the fingerprint in terms of which harmonic resonances are most highly activated or least highly activated. And that's a kind of a different technique to other, other, other things. Okay. So I wanted to discuss a little bit about the uh, how connectome harmonics may fit into these, some of these Bayesian brain frameworks. And so we can think about these connectome wide resonances as connectome specific harmonic waves. And perhaps we can also think of, of resonances that are more locally defined as RSHWs, regional specific uh, harmonic waves. And those may be more involved in performing specific specialized computations, whereas the connectome harmonics may actually be a, a mechanism for, for carrying these priors. We talked, I talked a little bit before about how perhaps the, the alpha frequency band is, is associated with the, the carrying of those priors, but perhaps we could also think of the low frequency harmonics as carrying the, the, those priors. And I think as a, a motivating principle here, there's a concept, uh, two concepts that I think it would be important to, to talk about. One is the, the way in which sound waves travel through media. And so much lower frequency, higher wavelength, sound waves are able to travel much further through a variety of, of media. And so that's why you have the, the phenomena of, of you know, bass in, in music, um, uh, being able to travel through walls and travel through physical objects much more easily, whereas higher frequencies are much more spatially localized. And you, you see that in, in these resonances in the brain as well, where it's much easier for a low frequency harmonic to propagate throughout the brain than a high frequency harmonic, which would be much more spatially uh, localized. And so the the idea is perhaps these connectome wide resonances are actually carrying some of these priors in, 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 in the entire brain. And the second idea here I want to discuss is something called injection locking. And this is a very <laughs> strange phenomena where if you start several, if you put several metronomes, and I have a, a picture here in the bottom, um, on, on a surface and you start them all, even in a random configuration, eventually they will all synchronize. And this happens because it, it, it wouldn't happen if you weren't on a, a, um, a moving surface. But basically, there is an average direction to the motion of the, of the uh, metronomes. And eventually, that average direction will pull all of the metronomes into, into alignment, taking exactly the same rate. And so perhaps this mechanism of injection locking is also what we see in terms of propagating signals between resonances with, within the brain. And Yes, and another interesting um, component to this is, is there's discussion of, of especially in, in the context of psilocybin-assisted therapy, the default mode network as being the carrier for the ego. And uh, there's actually a cortical reconstruction that you can do from connectome harmonics, where you find that the, the harmonics that are around, I believe, wave numbers number, number nine to uh, like plus or minus two, you, you find that, that those actually define the default mode network pretty clearly. And so perhaps this is another mechanism that can be used in a complementary way to look at the activity of those brain regions that are highly associated with, with the construction and, and of, of the ego. And, and that construction is something that is subjectively correlated quite closely with the activity of ego disillusion, which happens quite, quite often under the influence of psychedelics. And so this may be a, a complementary mechanism or understanding where in the brain that that phenomenological character is defined. Okay. Um, uh, this is another image from the Rebus paper, and we see the the sort of flattening of the free energy landscape here that happens under the influence of 
of psychedelics. And I believe I've basically covered this in my explanation of the last slide, but perhaps just to say again, we can view connectome harmonics as offering a, a complementary mechanism for the disruption and change in precision weighting of the priors that is sort of the core, the core effect of, 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 of psychedelics according to this, this framework. And we can say that an interesting effect that was noticed by Atasoy et al. in, in 2017 was that under the influence of psychedelics, we see a, an increase in the energy and power spectra across, and so those are the spectra that I, I showed here, um, across the board under the influence of, of LSD and particularly under the influence of LSD combined with music. And there was also a shift in the distribution towards the upper frequency harmonics. And that is somewhat consistent with this account of, again, the, the lower frequency harmonics being carriers for some of these, these top-down priors. And that those are somewhat disrupted or, or down-regulated within uh, the context of the state. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, we first considered this idea in the context of, of meditation, not, not psychedelics, actually. And I think there's actually, this is sort of a more general, perhaps as an as a emotional belief updating mechanism that can be engendered by various states, which results in a, sort of a, a broad scale change in energy levels. And that that can come from deep meditation or music or some of these techniques in combination, actually. And I mentioned the idea of these top-down priors being Bayesian energy sinks. And I think it's interesting to think about how these energy sinks can be uh, can be skirted, sort of how these top-down priors can be weighted. And, and there's three, three mechanisms that we have been considering here. One is that they can be deactivated and that sort of, and the examples that we give there are something like the death of a loved one or falling in love, uh, a, a, a process where it just feels like your, your world model breaks and everything just sort of instantly falls apart uh, versus this mechanism being overwhelmed as, as is the case in, in psychedelics for this, this bottom up energetic injection of some kind is able to overwhelm the energy sinks and then also avoided. And that brings in this concept of semantically neutral energy for meditation. And so the idea of semantically neutral energy is, is neural excitation that is not associated with any particular cognitive, sensory, or emotional process. And there are, of course, many proposed semantic networks in, in the brain. Most of them seem to be left lateralized for their uh, contribution to our, our language system. But we posit that one of the things that, that meditation is doing is it's actually providing a source of, of energy to the system that is not picked up by any of those, those processes that are applying semanticity to, to the, the uh, the process, and therefore it, it's sort of avoiding some of these these energy sinks and these mechanisms for top-down constraint uh, on the system, and it allows energy to build up in these harmonic resonances. And I think the concept—I'm not sure if I have this in the slide here—but um, the idea of, of resonance itself, oh, sorry, uh, idea of resonance itself is sort of this constructive activity of of increasing the act activation of some of these core uh, physical waves and so we see not only is there an increase in the in sort of the, the bottom-up excitation but there's perhaps also an avoidance of certain existing mechanisms that could provide top-down constraint uh, so to to continue a little bit on this on this thread especially things like mantra based meditation where there's a term that's picked for the meditation that has no semantic meaning, and that's an intentional component of the of the meditation technique. We expect that to essentially provide a quicker meditative flow state because it it takes advantage of this this idea of of providing additional semantically neutral energy into the system. And we also think that connectome harmonics, as I mentioned, you know, can be used as a fingerprinting mechanism for many different types of states. And it could be interesting to look at particularly these these jhana meditation states that we're interested in as being uh, a certain set of harmonic configurations. And so that's a, just sort of a different take potentially on, on how to, to view these states. And yes, I think I've covered the other two bullet points in the previous slide. There's also 
I think something about music, which um, can be said to maybe like hack the brain <laughs> in a particular way. So it has a, a very interesting balance between things that are highly ordered and predictable and things that would, would spark prediction error. And so it's, it should be predictable enough that allows for the sort of accumulation through resonance in the, in the core harmonics of the brain, but also it's able to not be entirely predictable, not be entirely boring, <laughs> such that it's able to sort of, I guess, you know, dodge these top-down models that exist in the, in the brain as well. And so I think there's going to be definitely something interesting about looking at the intersection of music with and without lyrics, with and without semantic content, combined with things like psychedelics and and meditation to see what sort of differential effects these things might have in terms of their propensity to drive some of these annealing effects. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how to um, understand the signatures of, of, of annealing. And I think there's you know, potentially a, a tail wagging the dog, dog wagging the tail problem of most positive therapeutic outcomes we expect will be positively correlated with the spectrum of successful annealing. And but we don't want to simply define successful annealing as resulting in positive therapeutic outcomes. And so one proposal that we've been thinking about is thinking of the annealing process as a traversal through a two-dimensional energy entropy landscape. And you can measure this by energy levels in the, in the connectome harmonics and by entropy in similar ways that Robin Carter Harris has, has um, proposed. And what we're really looking for, we think, is not just a low entropy, the, the cooling process of annealing will result not only in a state which is low entropy, but also one that is low entropy relative to its energy level. So you could have annealing that happens at a higher energy level, but has relatively low entropy or low entropy with low energy. But what you're looking for is kind of that, that relative difference, we think, between the, the entropy relative to its energy level. And I think it's also very important that the the content that's introduced during the cooling process is is quite important because it's uh, the the characteristic of some of these states is that they leave people being quite suggestible, and so kind of a component of the set and setting, as it's called, for for psychedelic therapy in the future, could be what sort of music or content or or talk therapy should come at the end of of, a, of one of these states, when someone might be in a highly suggestible state where their their models of the world are being are being updated in some significant way, I think it's important to consider not just sort of giving, I guess, like junk food to the, to the mind as that's happening. Maybe the best thing is just to immediately go to sleep <laughs> right afterwards. But anyway, that's just something that I think will be important to think about in the future as we move forward with these, these techniques. Um, so one final concept that I wanted to bring into the conversation is this idea of algorithmic reductions in psychedelic states. And that's something that we've looked at at Curie as well. Um, and the idea of an algorithmic reduction as opposed to something that's more characterized by an atomistic reduction, the atomistic reductions are looking for, you know, what are the atoms of this, of this concept? What are the, the core primitives? It's actually quite difficult to do in a lot of phenomenological contexts uh, because Consciousness is, is inherently and characteristically unified. And so it's very difficult to do good atomistic reduction on this extremely interdependent and, and unified experience. But it's possible to do something that's, that's more process oriented or sh sort of shape oriented. What are, what are sort of the, the core algorithms, the core clusters of algorithms that we can find within the psychedelic effects that we can focus in on? And uh, so, Looking at there's a there's a broad range of of characterized and and taxonomized psychedelic effects, but we think those can be appropriately broken down into four core algorithmic reductions of psychedelic states. One of them is something called control interruption, and so that leads to a characteristic effect of, of tracers or drifting or uh, tracers within visual experience often, and that's what this upper upper left GIF is showing is and it, it, this may, the mechanism of of this in the brain is uh, unclear. I, I, it, perhaps it's a disruption between some modules of the thalamocortical loop. It's, I'm, I'm not sure, but essentially it leads to a 
a change in the in the refresh rate of your experience. I think is an uh, appropriate way of, of thinking about it, and that results in these these uh, tracer effects where you see sort of a blinking or or a buildup of a different qualia in your experience. And there's drifting, which can be seen right here, where it's just sort of this morphing and changing of the of the texture. And this happens in cross modality, but it's easiest to talk about within the visual modality. And then uh, something called apophenia or enhanced pattern recognition, where there are, and this again happens in a cross modality way, but we can see that there are perhaps spurious, but sort of just an increase in the brain's propensity, the mind's propensity to make connections between potentially unrelated things. And one of the interesting examples of this in enhanced pattern recognition in apophenia is something called pareidolia, which is seeing faces in, in scenes where faces actually exist. So here's an example of a scene that but often this happens, you know, in, in natural scenes where it seems like elements of the of the scene will coalesce around face-like structures when those aren't really there. And then the fourth effect that I wanted to, to dig in upon is, is symmetry detection. And that's one that I think I don't see as discussed in the literature, even at the psych science of psychedelics increases in its importance and in, in the depth of, of research. But I think it's a very core effect, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Essentially, there's kind of a, a threshold at which are similar to the, the threshold at which our brain recognizes patterns, the threshold at which it recognizes symmetries. And that, that seems like there's a reduction in the threshold at which a symmetry is recognized under the influence of a psychedelics. And another interesting example of this pareidolia comes from a generative network called Google DeepStream, where initially a, an image classifier is trained on images of, of well, it's ImageNet, but that includes a lot of images of dogs and, and cats. And when you look at the early layers of this artificial neural network and you, instead of doing gradient descent, which is the process of minimizing error according to some cost function, but instead you, you increase the activity in the early layers and do gradient ascent, you, you end up with this generative network which overrepresents features and images that come from the features that it's recognizing in the classification. So you see a lot of things that look like, look like dogs. And so that's, again, I think it's, it's unlikely that the true mechanism of updating in the brain is based on the same mechanism that's happening in these artificial neural networks. It's probably not uh, back propagation. And that's actually something that I was reading about this week earlier that there's a, been a recent unification by a group at the University of, of Sussex in, in terms of the core math behind predictive processing as implemented in artificial neural networks and as characterized by Hebbian plasticity rules and back propagation, which is that that algorithm for for minimizing uh, for for updating weights and biases in order to minimize cost function in artificial neural networks as commonly characterized, and so again I think this it's, it it points to the fact that there are certainly these similarities across the the updating mechanism in in both of these systems, but perhaps the the true algorithm is different, and this other image is just a an example of sort of these symmetric tessellations that we see in the reduced threshold for symmetry detection. And so a perhaps more speculative idea that we wanted to introduce is how annealing occurs in a phenomenological context. So we take phenomenology very seriously at QRI. And one of the things that we think is, is interesting about, about uh, neural annealing as viewed through a phenomenological lens is that in a similar way to annealing and metallurgy being a process of forming more regular crystalline structures that have these property these properties of things like fertility and, and strength, we could we also notice that there's a correlation between the subjective positive valence of of a psychedelic experience and the propensity for there to be this increased symmetrical pattern recognition. And there's actually a way that we Imagine testing this, which is in a similar way to this, this neural network, which was trained to classify images and then was used to overrepresent the features of those images. We could create a generative network which classifies what are called the 17 wallpaper symmetry groups. This is an idea that comes from, from group theory. There are 17 ways to tessellate a, a primitive in 2D space. 
And if you have a classifier which classifies these, these 17 wallpaper symmetry groups as they exist in, in images and then overrepresent those features, we think that that will actually, well, we actually have some preliminary evidence to see that that will look very similar to effects that are seen on the influence of psychedelics and that we estimate that, um, or we, we, we predict that there will be a correlation between the number of recognizable wallpaper symmetry groups in any given experience and the, the positive valence of that experience. And there's almost this sort of phenomenological crystallization of your experience at the end of a positive psychedelic trip that could be a signature of, of this annealing process in, in the mind as well. This is just an example. I think this is star 632. I don't quote me on that, but this is an example of, of recognizing one of these wallpaper symmetry groups in a, in a symmetrified image. So you look at these symmetry points and you can see, I think this is at this, this symmetry group. Um, this is just an example of, of something that might, that looks pretty you know, consistent with, with reports of psychedelic effects and also uh, potentially illustrates where these, what these wallpaper symmetry groups are and where they might be shown in your experience. Uh, so one of the important things about making any good theory in the field of, of consciousness research is that there should be empirical predictions that fall out of it, that. And it's actually quite a difficult thing to do, but we want to make sure that there are empirical predictions to any theory. Um, and so one interesting effect that we were looking at was the alpha, like the large alpha suppression that we see in and then DMT, and this is from a 2019 study from Zimmerman. And of course, this is very consistent with the, with the account in Rebus of the suppression of the alpha band. We'd love to look at the connectome harmonic signature of, of engendered by a DMT and see, is there, oh, is there also this correspondence between the power and energy defined by the lower frequency harmonics and, and this alpha suppression. We also would predict that mantra-based meditation techniques, which take advantage of this semantically neutral energy component will more quickly result in meditative flow than things like insight practice, which are often more semantically loaded. And so that's another prediction that we'd have. And as I just mentioned, that changes in the perceptual uh, symmetry detection threshold and the quantity and type of symmetries that are observed in psychedelic states will positively correlate with successful therapeutic outcomes with successful annealing and also with emotional valence of psychedelic experiences. And those things are deeply interrelated. And I, I think it would also be very interesting to examine the role of, of lyrics and other semantic content in music when it's used for psychedelic therapy, because it's possible that the, the semantic content can contr contribute to activating some of these you know, core harmonic resonances of the brain, but then there's also the countervailing stance of the semantically, semantically neutral content being more useful for skirting some of these top-down prior, some of these energy sinks that exist in our experience. So there's some examples of empirical predictions that we would make from neural annealing that we could potentially test in the future. And the key takeaways that we wanted to present here are that neural annealing as a, as a complementary physical implementation for Rebus in the context of connectome specific harmonic waves and explaining connectome specific harmonic waves and their functional role in some of these Bayesian brain theories. And then expansion of um, EBH to music and meditation and uh, to point out the, the significance of semantically neutral energy in healing states and healing. And I believe that's, that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to say thank you again, everyone for listening and I'm happy to take any questions or comments that anyone has. Thanks.